So go ahead and hit the record and get everything uh, set up over here on. Uh, okay. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, all right, so now we are live. And uh, so I wanna thank everybody for joining us today uh, for this virtual reading with uh, Daniel um, Vandever, or as they say sometimes uh, with the sports broadcasting, Van Dever. Nay. <laughs> so uh, we really appreciate Daniel taking time uh, to uh, share with us with his readings and a lot of his creative output. Uh, so we'll um, kind of do slide shares, things like that. And as we go along, uh, we can also, um, you know, have questions, talk about um, your books and how kind of how your ideas came about, especially, um, you know, being an author and, um, you know, at that being the net, um, because, you know, there's always uh, sometimes that uphill uh, battle that some people do have in trying to publish their works, uh, especially from a indigeneity perspective, or in our case, for uh, having that uh, really good proper dinner representation. So uh, for some of you who may not be familiar with Daniel, um, I'll go ahead and let him uh, turn over the floor to him. So you know, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, well, I want to thank uh, Donovan and everybody at the Navajo Nation Library for allowing me the opportunity to speak uh, in this series. I was um, just checking out the most recent reading he had with Brian Young, and I think that you got you all are the first that have invited the 2022 American Indian Youth Literature Award winner. So, I thought that was a pretty cool distinction, and I think what better place to have that than at the Navajo Nation Library? So, I really appreciate the opportunity to read my books with you all today, and then provide some insight into how I got the stories published and the route I took. I think for me, um, that route is never straight. It's always some type of zigzag. Um, and I think in getting our voice out there, it really requires us to fall out of line in a sense and not you know, follow in others' footsteps and really paving our own path. And so um, I really appreciate the invite and uh, being able to talk about my experience. And so uh, my name is Daniel Vandiver and I'm the author of two books. My first book was published in 2017 through Salina Bookshelf, and it was titled Fall in Line Holden, which was a 2018 American Indian Youth Literature Award honor book. And then most recently, I self-published Horizon, which was um, honored with the distinction of best picture book uh, through the AIYLA on this previous uh, year, or just recently in January. And so the experiences I think are really important um, that I really in, intent on sharing with others, perhaps inspiring more voices being involved in getting our stories out there since um, there's a study done in 2018 where just 1% of books published in that year contained a Native American First Nation character. And so having diverse representation and stories authentic to who we are is important and um, is really my intent in self-publishing. So um, thank you everyone for attending. I uh, hope to answer as many questions as I can and provide some insight into uh, the road I took. Uh, I come to you from the community of Haystack, New Mexico, um, is where I'm from. Uh, Navajo, it's called Zitlachi, uh, meaning Red Mountain, Red Mesa. So if you're ever passing through Window Rock to Albuquerque, uh, we're just outside of Grants, New Mexico, in the southeastmost corner of the Navajo Nation. You'll see this big old red mountain off to the left, and this is Haystack. Uh, but this is the community I'm from um, and where I call home. Uh, traditionally speaking, you know, Irish and Shle, Kiani Bushes Chin, Irish Tasha Che, Aratachini Tashanella, Egoton and Shle. This is how I'm a Navajo person. And through Navajo, uh, you know, we're a matrilineal society, so your identity comes from your mother. My first clan is that I am Irish, and that comes from my mother. You'll see the picture of her off to the left right there, and me as a young young boy. Uh, but I always joke around and say I'm the luckiest Navajo you'll ever meet because I'm Irish. 
got that luck of the Irish behind me. And so that's my first clan. Uh, my second clan is I'm Kia Ani, which is Towering House Clan. Uh, that's from my father by way of his mother. And you'll see a picture of my grandma, grandmother up in the right corner. Her name is Bessie Desiderio Vandiver. And so um, Towering House from her. My maternal grandfather was also Irish. And then my paternal grandfather is Tachini, or the Red Running Into the Water Clan. And you'll see a picture of my grandfather off into the right, uh, right there. And traditionally, Tachini is in the, in the Navajo uh, it was a clan of the warriors, you know, red running into water. So you'll see him dressed up in his military gear. But as I had mentioned, this is who I am as a Navajo individual. And you'll see a picture of my family at the bottom. Uh, there's a picture of my grandfather, my grandmother, my brother. In addition to being a warrior, my grandfather was also a medicine man. So you'll see a picture of him uh, and our family Hogan below. I always like to point to my grandfather as a source of inspiration to becoming a writer, uh, primarily just because he was a, a co-talker during World War II. So you'll see a picture of him as a young man off to the left and then in his older years off to the right. Uh, and he used to always really convey to me the importance of your words. He used to always say you could either make somebody's day or break it by the words that you state. And realizing the power of words and language I think um, the Navajo code talkers are the ex perfect example of who to look to and then seeing what that power really is. You know, having the ability to speak and communicate helped save thousands, not millions of lives during World War II. I figured if my grandfather could use those words in that language uh, to save lives, I could use the same words and language to help communicate and advocate for our communities and our existence. And so that's what I did. And so my first story, which I'd like to read with you all today, um, was inspired out of that. Um, using a book to promote social change and improving our communities and talking about a period of history um, all of our relatives had went through. So um, the first book that I'll read through is titled Fall in Line Holden, uh, written and illustrated by myself, Daniel W. Vandiver. Um, so it begins. Deep in the heart of indigenous nation stood a strict Western school of stern education where everyone obeyed and did what they were told and conformity ruled all to fit like a mold until a boy fell out of line. As class ends and recess begins, we all fall in line. We pass through the halls with art covered walls. We all fall in line. You can see that Holden and his class are passing art class here. I see some pictures on the wall of a lion, zebra, and giraffe. We march left and then right with no end in our sight. We all fall in line. Fall in line, Holden. You can see where his Holden's classmates were passing the hallways, the beauty of the everyday, kind of just dismissing it. As Holden's passing by, those animals actually come and pop out of the art and interact with them. And we see again, lion, zebra, and the giraffe. We bypass the laughs of the custodial staff. We all fall in line. Fall in line, Holden. And you could see that instead of seeing joking janitors in Holden's imagination, they turn into rodeo clowns. This guy even jumps into his little trash bucket there. We move slowly in silence with no words of defiance. We all fall in line. We pass the school's gym as a battle begins. We all fall in line. Our tired minds lag and our heavy feet drag. We all fall in line. Fall in line, Holden. And you can see instead of seeing a dodgeball game at gym, it turns into an ancient Roman battle. Spartans running around with swords. We pass the lunch crew to the smell of mutton stew. We all fall in line. Fall in line, hold in. You can see the cafeteria staff turn into witches. 
Your little oven turned into a cauldron too. We do as we're told and don't dare to be bold. We all fall in line. In respectable fashion, we pass the lab's distractions. We all fall in line. And though our backs ache, our spirits never break. We all fall in line. Fall in line, Holden. And you can see all of those computer screens came together to form a spaceship. And the two boys turned into astronauts. Our class rambles on to the band's rhythmic song. We all fall in line. Fall in line, Holden. You can see that they're no longer in single file choir, uh, choir line, jamming out with a drum and a trumpet and all those music notes turn into birds. With the playground in sight and just the glimmer of light, we all fall in line. But as we reach the door, we can't take it anymore. And we all fall out of line. And so you can see that the class finally made it to recess and all of the other kids who you see fall out of line at the end of the book are in color interacting with Holden's imagination. If you look closely, you might see the zebra from the art classroom, the witches from the cafeteria, the joking janitor and his hula hoop in the back has the clown, Spartan running around and the birds and the music notes. And so in this first book, you know, I really wanted to promote the creative imagination and advocating for the youth to really appreciate what makes them different, to fall out of line and be themselves, you know, whether that's boys with long hair or people who dress differently. I think when you engage in things like art and PE and music, you know, your world expands and it becomes a lot brighter. But oftentimes when we're in the classroom these days and things like standardized tests are promoted, you know, that world's a lot dark. And you look at this picture, not even the teacher's happy, you know, I always say that. Um, but if you like Holden and you promote that imagination, then I think you know, your world expands and you get more creative. I wrote this book with intention um, to really speak to an era that isn't always talked about that much. Um, it's come to the light uh, most recently with the discovery of a lot of the bodies at boarding schools up in Canada and throughout the US. Um, but I, I felt that it was necessary to have a book that talked about that history, which was really a grim period of history that westernized a lot of indigenous people throughout the world. Uh, there's the saying, kill the Indian, save the man. That whole philosophy impacted generations of our people. And I think it has lasting impact on us today, which is scary because if you think about it, my grandfather, just a generation using the Navajo language to help save thousands of lives, just one generation removed. My father went through boarding school era education. And he went through the horrors of having his hair cut. He used to talk about all of the females that would come in, would get their hair chopped across the front, down to the side and all the way around. So it kind of looked like they had a helmet or a mushroom on their head. My father would talk about stories of getting his entire head shaved except for his bangs. So if he got in trouble, he'd get pulled by them. And I think it has had a lasting impact on our communities. And it's uh, made a lot of progress and growth and even retaining our language difficult. And so people mention about, oh, it's so tough working on Navajo because of this, this, and this. I think a direct correlation could be drawn to this period of education that was forced upon us. So um, I know it's kind of tough being able to talk about getting your hair cut and physical abuse in a children's book. So my intention with Fall in Line Holden was to write a book where that space could be talked about among parents or grandparents and a child. And so and that was the whole purpose behind uh, the first book. So I'd like to read my second book with you all today, but um, it is a wordless book in that there are no words to add to the story. So it's really on us to use our imagination to put words to it. So I know I was kind of reading at you with the first book. I'd like to make this interactive. So if you're on the Zoom, 
feel free to use the chat box or unmute yourself as I ask questions because it's going to involve that type of interaction, uh, which I think is the beauty of wordless books. It allows for space for the imagination to be enhanced and for everybody to make the story their own. So it's important for us as we're reading this to put on our looking goggles, really using our eyes to see what's happening in the picture to tell us what's going on. So to test our interaction and seeing if that chat function works, I'd like to just ask a question, looking at this cover, what do you notice? I think by looking at what's on the cover is gonna give us some, some insight into what the book is about. So if you wouldn't mind using the chat and I'll be monitoring it. Um, you know, what are some of the first things you might notice? Somebody had mentioned, I, I noticed a hot air balloon. So you notice this big old hot air balloon that's in red. Perfect. Uh, that might indicate that this is a story about travel or a journey. Um, somebody had described it as an epic journey at some point. Miss um, Martin noticed that it also is with grandma's scarf. So if you know that Sonny scarf, it has that design to it. So it's maybe authentic to our indigenous people in, in having that representation. If you look a little bit closer, you might notice that there's some activity going on down here. Um, and that there's people hurting what looks like white animals, uh, perhaps about sheep. So this is a story about hurting sheep um, and everything that goes with that. And then you might also notice this big old mesa on the horizon or the distance. And um, we had somebody notice that it's spelled a little bit differently rather than H-O-R-I-Z-O-N, it's H-E-R-I-Z-O-N. So most likely this is gonna be a story about a heroine or a female lead um, that drives the story. So perfect, you guys are doing great. That's how we're gonna read this story. So without further ado, Horizon, story uh, by Daniel W. Vandiver, illustrated by Corey Begay. And the story begins. So we notice here, right off the bat, you might see a few things, is that we have a grandmother out on the front porch tell she's a grandma by her scarf and her little cane here. She has something else in her hand too. If you can notice what that is, looks like a pair of binoculars. So she's looking at something into the distance. If you notice a little bit more, we might have a little character in here. What looks like she's indoors doing something and some puppies out below the porch. But the thing our eyes are probably drawn to right off the bat is that Sonny scarf that we noticed. She's looking at something in some binoculars. Wonder what she's looking at. Carlicia said she's looking for her sheep. Hey, perfect. And we notice right off the bat is that she's looking out and she does notice her sheep. But what do you notice? What's happening here? Looks like she got a couple of lazy boys sleeping on the job. What do you think grandma's saying in her head right here? Because we've got some lazy grandkids <laughs> as she's watching her sheep. Next page, it looks like she's using her gish to catch somebody's attention or her cane. And if we look closer from the first page, we notice that that character is a girl. And what is she doing inside? Looks like she might be doing some dishes. So after getting her attention, the girl dries her hand. Grandma gives her the binoculars. What do you think grandma's saying here? People are saying she's cooking and cleaning, making bread perhaps too. Grandma's pointing in the distance. Now the girl has the binoculars. Let's see what the girl sees. Juanita said, look at the sheep. They're wandering off. And look, you could see that the girl does see the sheep, but there's an additional character in this scene. She doesn't see the lazy boys, right? Let's see, uh-oh, looks like some coyotes who are hungry because they got sheep on their mind. And how do you think the girl feels about that? You think she's excited? Think she's happy? Maybe she's saying, oh no, she kind of has a worried look on her face. Well, what does grandma do? Looks like she gives her her scarf, right? 
She ties it up and she takes that dish rag. Wonder what grandma's telling her here. She's sending her out is what Juanita says. And that's exactly what's happening here. She ties up her head, uh, her scarf into a headband and the girl sets off. She's ready to run is what Carlicia says. What does she do with that scarf? What do you think that scarf's turning into? Let's find out. It looks like that scarf turns into a hang glider. And she's flying high above the sky, almost like she's in the airplane. We could see those big old mitten rocks up in the distance, and we see an animal. Is that the coyote? Can you tell what animal that is? Let's see if we could take a better look. Horses! Yes, Elizabeth says it's a horse. Juanita, too. But we could see how high she's flying as she's floating with those butterflies as she holds that scarf above her head. And if we look closer, they are horses. We got a white one, a blue one, a yellow one, a black one. What do you think she's gonna do? Where's she flying to? Let's find out. Juanita says she's gonna jump on them. That's exactly what happens. We could see that that scarf now transforms. It's no longer a hang glider but it looks like a saddle blanket now. Do you think she's riding that horse slow? She's trotting along, was she fast? Looks like she's really booking it, huh? Really riding it hard. She's going fast because we could see that um, herself distance herself from that horse until, whoa! She gets bucked off like Juanita says and she goes over the edge. Do you think she's in danger? What do you think is going to happen to the girl? Let's find out. I always say this is when I would go cannonball. And we see that that scarf is now protecting the girl as she drapes it over her shoulders and she lands into the river below. And if we look at that bottom image, do you think she's still in danger there? Or do you think she's collecting herself a little bit? What does that scarf turn into next? It's almost like a little Tom Sawyer Huckleberry Finn tent as she collects herself and squeegees it off her skirt. You notice she's in water. They say water is life, right? It looks like it revived her in this instance. Hopefully she's safe. Carlisa said she looks worried. Why do you think she would be worried if you look at that top picture? Looks like she's not out of danger yet. We see a big old waterfall, more trouble is coming. But thinking on her toes, what does she turn that tent into? What does that scarf change into next? Well, we say, this is where I'd probably say, a whole new world. <laughs> Cassandra says she's now turning it into a flying carpet or a magic rug. And we could see that as she flies above the river below just escaping that danger in the nick of time and she's flying here it looks like king and Deshay. does she look in trouble now or does she look like she's kind of having fun here it looks like she's flying around spider rock elizabeth uh, notices that she's flying around spider rock which is the home of spider woman the deity who taught us how to weave so it's almost like she's revived flying high. She's having fun. She's getting to see everything, even up against the high cliffs of Kenyon Deshe. What's happening now? It looks like she's starting to come down, right? I wonder what that scarf is gonna turn into next. Maybe she's getting closer to the coyotes. Now we could see that that scarf is starting to turn into a parachute almost. If you guys have any kids who play Fortnite, it's like a glider. She's coming down to earth. And we could tell by that mountain in the background. Why do you think this is important? Is she as reckless as before? Like when she got bucked off her horse, is she taking her time a little bit? And now we see the image a little closer. And who do we notice from the beginning of the story? You might notice there's the sheep. And the coyotes coming across the uh, horizon. 
There's the lazy boys still sleeping on the job, not knowing what's going on. And there goes the girl with her magic scarf. I hope she gets there in time. Now, what does that scarf turn into? A slingshot. She has to get there. And what does she do? It looks like she shoots a nice little pebble over them as she chases off those wolves. There goes one of the sheep running in the opposite direction. But if you notice, we only have two of the coyotes being chased off. I wonder where the other one went. Now we see that the scarf turned into a nice little lasso. She might be joining our Danae College or NTU rodeo team because she has her scarf turned into a rope. And just in the nick of time, she saves the mutton, as Elizabeth says. This is that coyote swiping for that sheep. She gets a hold of it, ropes it in three sec seconds, it looks like. And just for good measure, that lasso turns into one more thing, what looks like a whip. Saying, get out of here, coyote, not today, as it runs off. And how do you think the girl feels here? Do you think she's still a little bit scared or worried? Or does she look tough like grandma? She has her hands on her hips. She's watching those coyotes whimper off into the distance. She might feel a little bit empowered like Cassandra is saying. She's even telling off her cousins here. I wonder what she's saying, telling them there. It looks like they're just waking up right there. And now what do you notice? It's the cover, right? And what does that scarf turn into here? It's that hot air balloon we're talking about. We see those naughty, lazy cousins below. It looks like they're finally returning home. And she's in that hot air balloon until they get home. How do you think the girl feels here? Maybe she might be happy that she's returned home and she was able to return to grandma, but maybe she's proud of what she accomplished. Maybe she looks a little sad, right? She might have to go back to the kitchen and give up her magic scarf. She's kind of hanging her head, so maybe she's a little sad. She's gonna have to give up her weapons or her nice little magic carpet, which could be bad, you know? or sad for her, but what does grandma do? What does she do with that scarf? Instead of taking back the scarf and giving her the dish rag, looks like she turns around the little girl and she ties up a tsie or a Navajo bun. So maybe the girl won't have to go back to the kitchen like Juanita had suggested. And we see her here on the porch She's not going back in there to do the dishes anymore. I wonder what she's looking at. If we look a little bit closer, you might notice some of those lazy cousins over there finally returning the sheep to the corral. And we end with it with her looking at the horizon as she ties up her scarf, ready to go back to work. If you notice a little bit closer, you see some of the characters from the story. Maybe she's going to go back and finish off those coyotes, make sure that they don't come back for the sheep maybe she's going to be a supervisor as Juanita mentioned or if we notice window rock there maybe she's the next president maybe that's on her horizon maybe she's going to fight casinos and make sure that that money stays in her elders pockets or if you notice there's a coronavirus perhaps she's going to be a doctor or bring technology to her community or fly with the butterflies and birds again. She's our Navajo Wonder Woman is what somebody had said. So that's how the story ends with her looking at the horizon, ready for her next journey, realizing what she can do. She's ready to take on the world. And so the whole point behind this story is it's titled Horizon as it's something into the distance. But really it's a story of the moment now, especially after we have our first female vice president with Kamala Harris, or we have Deb Holland serving as the uh, Secretary of the Interior. And if you notice closely at her mask, what kind of design is that? 
she was using that Sonny scarf design as a source of protection as she did her swearing in. And really it's a time of the now for our females to get back to our matrilineal society. And that recognition is there. Just recently, we had the very first indigenous female uh, win the Caldecott Award uh, with Carol Lindstrom and Michaela Goad. You see that picture there. If you notice a lot of the activism and the progress that's happening in our community, it's coming from female leaders like Native Women Lead, or if you look at the organization uh, Navajo Hopi COVID Relief Effort, that's all female driven. And to me, I wanted to write a book that spoke to that, that brought back this encouragement and served as a source of inspiration for my nieces that encouraged a more inclusive future to see a heroine and say, hey, I could do that too. And if you noticed in that book, a lot of the places were real. Um, you had Monument Valley in there, Mother Earth being something we should protect. You had Grand Falls, Arizona for the waterfalls, the little Colorado River with the, um, when she was revived in the river. And then again, Spider Rock as another source of um, reference for the book. So um, as I mentioned, this is a story of the moment of the now. Uh, but it's something that I was hoping could help inspire people to move forward and protecting what's ours. And so those are my two readings. Uh, I wanted to thank you guys for listening today. Uh, I know that there's a lot of questions and interactions that happen with this session. So I'd be more than happy to take any questions now or even talk further about my process or my publishing experience since I did have two different experiences. Um, but I really appreciate um, the time given to me by Donovan and his staff. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them now. I think Donovan had to step away, I'm seeing in the chat box, so. No questions? <laughs> uh, Daniel. Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. I had I a question. Um, how long does it take to write your books? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, actually, writing them, uh, it does take quite a while. Fall in Line Holden probably took about seven years from when I first thought of it until it finally getting published. Uh, it was a story that I started for my nephew and that I wanted to gift him something that I created rather than bought. And so um, it started with sketches and an idea of, all right, I want a story that really highlights the creative imagination and allowing a story to speak to his um, creative self, his individuality. And so it started as that in which I was going to just put something together and create his own little book. But along the way, I met, ended up running into Corey Begay, which you'll see a picture here off to the right, who was the illustrator for Horizon. And at that time, he was working as the um, art director for Salina Bookshelf. And he told me, you know, we're a small independent publisher, uh, but we're looking for stories. Uh, we have a lot of young adult submissions, but one of the things we're lacking is picture books. And I said, hey, well, I have one. And so as a result of that, I passed along his, um, my manuscript that I was writing for my nephew, uh, just asking him, you know, if I were to get this published, what does it need? What needs to be in place? And without my knowing, he forwarded that along to the president of Salina Bookshelf. And they're like, hey, we're interested in this. But there are certain things or requirements that you have to have of a picture book in order for it to get published. And so they said, for instance, it's only 24 pages. We need at least 32 minimum if it's going to be a children's book. He also mentioned that this story takes place in a boarding school, but there's no evidence of that actually being in a boarding school. Uh, so I had to go back and make those adjustments from when I first submitted it to Corey. I had to come up with um, extra ventures. So that's when you saw them go out to space. And then that's where you saw the music class um, with the birds. I added those detours. Uh, and then that very first page in setting the stage deep in the heart of indigenous nations to the strict Western school of Stern education uh, that came from setting the, the, the scene. And so those things had to go into place. Uh, they also asked, you know, how, how um, is the character growing? If we're going to be having a story about a character, we want to see character growth. And that was very difficult for me at first because I was like, how do you show growth in the character? 
who's actualized and sees the world as it should be. Um, so I had to go back there and show his influence through his classmates. So if you go back and see Fall in Line Holden again, every time he gets in trouble, Fall in Line Holden, one of his classmates' heads turned, and then he gets in trouble again, and another head turns, and another head hurt, turns, until finally at the end, they all fall out of line, come into color, and you see his influence through that process. So, um, Salina only accepts a manuscript once a year on June 1st. And so I submitted it that day and then got that feedback. And so I had to wait a whole nother year in order to get that feedback, uh, get those adjustments again and then get it published. But once they received the updated manuscript, uh, it took less than three months for it to get published, printed and um, to press and then distributed. I think a big benefit to that was because I did all of the illustrations myself. They didn't have to go and find an illustrator and get it underway. Um, they just had to work with Corey on doing some touch-ups to it, and then it was ready to go. So uh, once that process was done, it took less than three months to get finalized. Horizon, on the other hand, since it was self-published and I did it myself, took less than a year um, from when I uh, thought of the story, how it was going to be structured, working with Corey and getting, getting the illustrations, having some back and forth of how are we gonna lay it out? How are we gonna work with moving the eye through the pages? Um, even boxing it up and you know, how do you carry an eye from one, one page to the next? Uh, we really collaborated on getting that together. And then uh, what, what, once it was done, uh, the rest were just, all right, how are we gonna print it now? How are we gonna price it? How are we gonna do fulfillment? Uh, which is basically warehousing and then shipping it out. So then I had to do the website. I had to build all of that individually. Um, but all of that took less than a year um, once we had the story down. So if you're really dedicated, it could take less than a year, especially if you know the route you want to take. There are options available like print on demand through services like um, Amazon, um, a couple of other um, fulfillment type of agencies like Book Baby. Um, they could do that for you. So if you know those channels and you know the process, it can be relatively fast. But if you're to go through a big five publisher, I know last time Brian Young had talked about being represented by one of those, it could take years, up to three years to actually get approval and go through their process as well. So I hope that answers it. It's kind of along those spectrums, but it's basically how committed are you to getting it done? But if you know who you're going to do, um, the illustrations with how you're going to progress through it, then it can be relatively easy. Uh, we have another question, and that's from Carlisha. She had mentioned, are you going to write any more? Um, well, my first book was for Holden, who was um, the inspiration be behind Fall in Line Holden. After he got his book, all of my nieces and nephews were like, hey, where's mine? So then I lumped them all together in Horizon and saying, all right, this is your book. And so um, and now, now I have a son, so I need to write one for him. Um, but I do have two concepts that I want to flesh out, um, including another picture book um, that I kind of have roughly titled We Weave, uh, which is going to be a story about weaving and technology. Um, and then I have another young adult book that I'm aiming for middle school um, students. Um, which is also going to be about um, promoting female and STEM careers and this girl who kind of is similar to uh, Holden and that she falls out of line and is always kind of overlooked. So uh, those are two things that I kind of have in the pipeline. I just have to flush out and uh, put together, but um, hopefully I can get those out within the next year or so. Uh, we had another question from Lynn Curtis. She said, what advice would you give to someone that wants to write a book? Uh, my advice would be to just do it, you know, start with little sketches, maybe throw, do little thumbnails, um, but always keep practicing and uh, writing. And it's best to do it with things you love, you know, so if you're into music, you could start writing by doing lyrics, um, drawing pictures, you know, you could tell a story so many different ways, uh, but it's just what your starting point is. And my biggest advice would be uh, be authentic to who you are and what your story is. I think we each have unique perspectives and backgrounds that you bring something that hasn't been done before. So as long as you bring um, what's true to yourself, I think that authentic, 
authenticity is what people get behind and take notice of. So um, my big advice is to stay true to who you are and how you wanna see your um, ideas or thoughts played out. When I was first um, creating Horizon, I actually fished it around to a couple of publishers and they loved it, uh, but they wanted to see words. That was their number one feedback is, well, that's good, but what are we? what is gonna be the case when we're trying to sell this to somebody in middle of Missouri or the East Coast who might not understand a lot of the things about what it means to be the neck? But to me, I wrote it wordless um, to speak to the voiceless, to those who might um, not always have a say in their home, the classroom, the community. And by it being wordless, it really raises and accentuates um, why is there no words? What is the reasoning behind that? Um, and so I was really firm on not putting words to it because for the four or so years that I was out giving readings, I noticed that story time or reading books can often be isolating for kids, especially those who aren't strong in their literacy. And so I wanted to provide a book that allowed space for individuals to give input. So I might not understand what's happening and how the sentence is structured or being able to read along by it, with it. But if somebody asks, have you ever felt like this? Or did, do you recognize anything in this book? Yeah, my grandma was like that too. We heard sheep. It provides avenues for others who might not always participate in circle time to participate and lend their, lend their voice to it. So um, by staying true to myself, I think that's what ended up keeping it wordless and allowed for it to be what it is today, which I think is something special, um, which fortunately was actually recognized with that award too. So uh, that would be my biggest advice is just to stay true to who you are and to write as much as possible in, in however many avenues um, you can think of, things that are passionate to you. So thank you for that question, uh, Ms. Curtis. We had another um, question. How did you come up with the ideas for these books? Uh, I think that the heart of all of the ideas was there were stories about the imagination. Um, I really, really am a strong believer in providing creative space for the youth um, to let their imaginations run wild. I think we have a lot of problems in our communities today um, that require outside the box thinking. And so in everything I write, I think I try to speak to those types of ideas and coming up with these books and promoting something that has resonance within the audiences that I speak to. And so if you have kids that go through the educational system today, it's a lot of this is how it's done. This is how we go about it. Um, but to me, I don't think that's where that creative um, space is fostered to think, um, promote outside the box thinking. And so um, the creative imagination is something that anyone with a kid can relate to. It doesn't have to be just Navajo or indigenous, it's any kid. And so um, that was one of the inspirations when writing these books. Um, as a follow-up question to that, somebody had mentioned that one of their students wants to write a children's book. How did you develop the story structure? Um, you got to start with the page numbers and how long is it going to be? So like I mentioned, you want to have at least 32 pages laid out and then you just fill it in from there. What is going to be the story? Uh, what is going to be the conflict? Who are the characters? What's the setting? You take those basic story elements and then you go from there. And if you wanted to just mimic and copy and see how other stories are created, um, you could use that as a good guide okay, this is how they told the story and we are water protectors. I'm um, talking about um, the big black monster, the snake, um, how they defeat it, and then it's resolved. You know, take those basic story elements and then go from there. Um, even if you wanted to practice, I think Horizon's a perfect template to begin with um, in understanding, all right, who are the characters? What's the setting? What's the um, conflicts that happen throughout the book until they finally... Um, reach the climax of the books and then had falling action and then it was resolved you know maybe you tell your own story putting words to horizon and then picking it up from there I think that would be a good perhaps start um, but understanding those basic story elements and then going from there is a big thing um, that was missing in fallen line Holden with um, you know character development how did you see the growth in that character I had to go back and make that adjustment but some of those things will come natural if you have to go back to the drawing board and then put that in, um, that's another approach as well. So 
Uh, that's the advice I would give. Uh, we have some more questions in the, it looks like the Facebook. Daughters are going to college online, sometimes struggle with writing essays and research papers. What advice do you have for them and for parents to support our students? Um, my advice is to keep it simple. You know, sometimes we could get lost in our writing by trying to meet uh, certain structures, but if you have an idea and you know how to convey it, you know, just start small with paragraphs. What is the topic of this paragraph? What are the supporting structures that need to be placed? If you're writing an essay on writing a book, all right, what are the three main topics you want to write about that? You know, you're going to have an intro and a conclusion, but then how do you sandwich that in with your three main topics? Um, just keeping a basic structure like that is a perfect starting point, and then you flush it out from there. Um, but I'm a big believer in keeping it simple. Don't try to overwhelm yourself with strong, fancy words. Um, my background is in advertising and strategic communications, and that might be a good writing prompt. Rather than telling your whole story across 332 pages, how can you tell that whole story in one page? How can you tell that one story in a paragraph? How can you tell that one story in a sentence or with three words and then breaking it down that way? Um, and then just keeping it simple in that sense. Um, I think the more you try to bring in so many different elements, you have a um, tendency to maybe stray and lose yourself. Um, but if you keep it simple, um, that might be the best approach. Um, that's what I would give at the moment. But you know, I'm gonna put my email in um, the chat box too. So if you wanted more information, I think these questions deserve more time to be given. And I'd be more than happy to continue that conversation out of this. But thank you for that question. I think um, writing is a powerful tool. I had um, seen in a conference or a um, uh, lecture by somebody recently, you know, um, you want to arm yourself with the weapons of your enemy and education has traditionally been our enemy and uh, writing has always been used against us. So if we're able to enhance our grasp on the language, on law, on education, whatever it might be, you know, we're empowering ourselves to move forward. And I think that's something that we have to have in our communities. So another question, I love the storyline and impressed of how fast the book was published. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of work. It kind of drove me crazy. I actually had to step away from my full-time job working at Navajo Technical University, um, which was what I was doing full-time. Um, but when I wanted to see this story through and I felt it was important, um, I ended up going that route and taking time off to you know go that route. So um, it took a lot of work. I'm not going to lie. It was crazy, frustrating at times. Uh, but I think that process is something I want to share with other writers so they don't have to deal with that. So I've been documenting everything um, in, with the intent of sharing it with others so then they don't have to experience a lot of those problems um, as well. Uh, going from everything of what's, who's the best printer to go with. Um, if we are doing distribution, should I go Amazon or Am I willing to give 50% of whatever I would make to them for them to produce it? Or would I rather get a larger chunk of that pie and I figure out my own distribution? I think in today's digital age, especially with social media, it's more viable for us to maintain full control of our stories and then push it out there into the world. And so there are different avenues we can take. We don't necessarily have to rely on the big five anymore or these other people to tell our stories. So it makes sure it makes it easier. So if you don't want to have to go and do a, and deal with all those headaches, um, you could have a nice package story and have it go out into the world. But then that does leave it susceptible to be compromised. So we're trying to sell more books or we want to capture this demographic in a certain area. Uh, we need to change up your story in this way. And so those are things that you kind of have to figure out a balance to and then go from there. But uh I appreciate that um, comments, Recling. Somebody had uh, asked, what are your hobbies when you're not writing? Um, 
I consider well, until I became a father this past year, my hobbies was hanging out with my nieces and nephews and just immersing myself in their world. I was the kind of that uncle of the year for the longest time. They always joke about uncles, but um, my hobbies is my family, you know, and being out there and diving into their interest is something that's big to me. So I got into Fortnite playing with my nephews and learning all of that crazy stuff. Um, I really like going outdoors. So um, my work in Crown Point, even though I left Navajo Technical University, I still volunteer in building trails, um, especially with COVID. Um, I think trails and outdoor recreation is something that's needed and necessary within our communities. Uh, so I do a lot of stuff within that realm. And then a lot, a lot of athletics, things of that nature. But I enjoy reading. I enjoy TV, um, anywhere where that has people putting together or creating um, things is, is what interests me. And I like looking at manuscripts or if I watch a movie, you know, what does that um, script look like? How do they structure that? How do they put that together? I really like looking at those types of things and finding inspiration there. So um, those are a lot of my hobbies that I try to push. And um, if it's community-based, community-centered, uh, that's where a lot of my interests lie as well. Somebody had mentioned uh, we're joining from the Dream Diné Charter School, cool in Shiprock, New Mexico. Currently, they're in math class with two-thirds students. How has math helped you in your illustrations? Questions from my students. Um, math really helps with layout. And for me, uh, finding out proportions, um, they have a rule of third thirds in design in photography. Um, so really finding balance um, is a big way that I use uh, in breaking down my images and how I structure it. Uh, math is a big part on the back end of things. So as a self-publisher, I'm having to figure out, all right, how much is the book going to cost not only to print, but to store in a warehouse, um, to buy a mailer, to then ship that out. Um, am I sending it USPS or am I sending it FedEx? Am I going to send it standard mail priority, which could be as high as $10 at times, or am I going to ship it media mail, which is $3.19 or $3.45, $4.19? You know, all of those numbers come into play. And if you're wanting to sustain yourself and um, not just give away these books for free, you got to do math to figure out what are the costs and um, how much is it going to cost to get out there? And if I wanted to keep writing these books, how much profit do I need to make in order to do another batch and things of that nature? So math is everywhere with what I do um, in creating the book and figuring out layout and proportions um, to doing the business end of things. Uh, math plays a big key part of it. And math is a language in its own, you know, they say. And so if you're able to write books through that, then that's another thing that you could venture into. Um, but I really appreciate what you do with your charter school and Dream Diné. If you guys ever want me to come and present or do anything, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, we only got a couple more minutes left, but let's see what other questions are out there. From Facebook, my daughter has a speech delay. So I like picture books where she can tell me a story. Yes, I love that because that's the value of these wordless books. Um, it allows teachers or anyone that's perhaps working with students who um, might have a speech impediments or delays or whatever it might be, it allows teachers to meet those students where they are, rather than having to bring the students up to a certain expectation of where it needs to be. On my website, I do include um, information on how to use a wordless picture book, so feel free to go to that website and learn a little bit more. Uh, but let me share this image that I had. Ah, my sharing screen has is, is no, is been um, disabled. Um, but the, the, some of the values of wordless books is that they help build confident, independent readers. Um, it allows readers to assign labels um, to words or pictures, which then helps build vocabulary, which then you can then transfer to books with text. So if you're able to build a vocabulary by looking at these images and drawing your own experiences, that can then be applied towards those stories with um, text. It allows to make cultural connections where this books do. So as I mentioned, if you're not having an ends to being at circle time and relaying to what's written in the book, 
you know, where these books allow you to share your own knowledge in relation to your culture or your history or your family norms or your geography, where you're from. Um, and then collectively that really builds basic literacy skills. It contributes to listening or listening comprehension, speaking, storytelling, all of those things, story retelling, inferring, predicting, this is what's gonna happen. And then once you build those basic literary skills, then you could then move on to those mastering those story elements. All right, tell me about these characters. What about the setting, the plot, the problem solutions? What was the beginning, middle and end of the story? And then you go from there. So where this books I think are beautiful and then they contribute to all of those things at once and really provide space who might, uh, for those types of re readers who might struggle with certain aspects of literacy. So, um, you know, that's what I would say to that. Um, it's a great way for um, those individuals to interact with um, books. At another question, your second book is illustrated and photos, no words, what inspired you to do that? Again, the big thing was that it it was written for the voiceless, those who might not always have a say um, in the classroom. But then on a larger scale, I wanted to draw um, awareness to things like murdered and missing indigenous women. If you notice one of the last images was the red handprint. Um, you know, our voices are being taken in those realms as well. And how often is it taken, uh, talked about with, other than when you see a missing persons poster or flyer. And so it being wordless, draws connections to that movement where I could say, hey, we are having our words taken from us literally uh, from our communities. We need to do something about it. Uh, recently, I um, did some work with an organization called um, Bold, <clears throat> Bold Futures, um, who was doing work on ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act. It being wordless allows tie-ins for that. So you could start talking about intergenerational homes and justifying why those are important and why that's true to our culture and that you don't just have a nucleus family of a mother, father, kids. Oftentimes in our household, it's extended family with kids living with grandparents, uncles, aunties, uh, that concept of eh, um, everybody kind of rearing the child together. And so I, I, I made it wordless to draw tie-ins with each and every one of those because I think they're all important and it provides an avenue for them to be talked about even mental health, I think there's tie-ins to this type of story, making cultural um, appropriate connections from people who come onto Navajo Nation. I see this book as a tool in order to um, talk about those things. And yeah, you're not just dealing with a kid and a mother and a parent. If you're a teacher on Navajo Nation, you might understand that they're also living with grandparents. You might understand that they're living in rural communities where <laughs> you have to pass through um, mud roads for a couple of miles even to get to a paved road, or you might have not have internet access, things of that nature. And so wordless books um, really speaks to all of those things at once. Uh, where can you get the Navajo Nation Library, get copies of the book? Um, currently it's only being sold on my website until I recoup a lot of the funds that I put into it. Uh, but eventually it's gonna be distributed to a lot of um, middleman, those uh, book distributors, uh, Amazon. Um, the big thing is like they take half of your money right off the bat. So um, if I go that route, it's eventually going to be getting into the hands of as many people as possible, which definitely interests me. Um, but I'm not there yet. So eventually it'll get um, distributed in those means. I, I, I just had an order from Barnes and Noble in Chandler, Arizona. So I think it's getting in stores as well. Northern um, Arizona Museum up in Flagstaff is purchasing some where you could get it. Uh, I had it in Butler's and Gallup for a while. Um, so I like to get it everywhere. It's just figuring out that math behind it and um, when am I making money? When am I losing it? So uh, I have a lot more questions. I know we're short on time. If it's okay, I, I, I wouldn't mind just covering all of them. Uh, yeah, Daniel, it's uh, totally up to you. Um, so, um, yeah, <laughs> um, just jumping okay. back on again, just because uh, <laughs> uh, finally, okay. hopefully handled some of the things I did. Um, I guess <laughs> kind of uh, <laughs> some of my uh, questions is, um, so as you're, as you're kind of, um, kind of writing out these, um, writing out your books and everything, 
what were what was kind of your plan as far as reaching to the readers um you know with you know not only following line holden but also with um horizon as well uh my big thing was reaching readers you know i didn't want these books to be something you read once and then it sits on the shelf I imagined each of these having lasting impacts and bridging intergenerational type of reading opportunities. And so how I structured how they were written was with purpose. You know, um, the first one, Fall in Line Holden, was written in rhyme and cadence, oftentimes because those are literacy tools to bring people in and start participating. You know, we all fall in line. We all fall in line. After a while, kids can pick up on that and then they're engaging with the story and it feels like they're reading and they become invested with it. Um, but I really wanted to structure that way so it engaged them on another level. And on top of that, I think there's a responsibility I have as a Native author to go out into the community and do readings, lending my time, not charging honorariums. I give free readings to any institution on the Navajo Nation because if not, where else are our kids going to see um, the path forward to becoming an author if they can't see someone who's Navajo just like them um, in, in paving that path forward? So um, I try to give as much readings as I can possibly so kids have somebody to look up to and say, hey, if that, that guy who has long hair like me can do it, I can do it too. Or that guy who grew up with a grandmother herding sheep like I did, I can do it too. And so um, a big thing that I feel is a responsibility as us, as native writers is, is you have to be out there in the community. This isn't a solo venture because we didn't get here by ourselves. I have a whole community behind me that brought me to this point. And I feel it's a responsibility to give back. And that's why I always try to do readings. That's why I'm always trying to get out there doing this type of work. Um, because it's not just me, it's all of us. So I hope that answers your question, Donovan. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, so we can go along with uh, the chat, just cutting in for a bit. Um, but um, Chantel asked, uh, what are your favorite books and genres to read? Uh, I like a lot of the fantasy, the books that really get you out there immersed in fantasy and um those that speak to the creative imagination. One of the very first books that got me excited about reading was the Harry Potter series. Um, that's when I really started reading on an intimate level, chapter books and chapters. But I think a lot of my favorites are those that relate to and reflect who we are as native people. So I think we're kind of in this nice rent. Well, it's always been there, you know, but now we're starting to be seen a little bit more. Uh, but any native created books and stories is what, is what always catches my attention. Um, people like um, Kevin Noble Mallard, who wrote Fry Bread, Cynthia Lydic Smith, Tracy Sorrell, a lot of those people who are carrying forth our voices in these books and these realms is what catches my attention. Brian Young is doing that with Youth Adult. And I know his isn't really, um, you know, fictional or um, fantasy uh, because those are our own stories you know so those are the things that really capture my attention and what I kind of am gravitated toward even um, older adult books I read that There There by um, Tommy Orange who is also a product of the Tribal College University movement um, those types of stories I think are important and I try to stay up to date on Definitely. Uh, the next question you have is, um, if you're going to do a presentation in school setting, how can people contact you? Uh, you can contact me on my website or send me an email and we could set something up. Um, just because I have a young kid right now, I'm mainly doing stuff um, virtually. Uh, but if I'm in the area, I'd be more than happy to come by and do some type of face-to-face -face, uh, reading. I know that I initially wanted to do that with Navajo Nation Library. Uh, but I'm traveling right now in St. Louis, Missouri, um, so I couldn't make that happen. But if it's possible, I'd, I'd you know, reach out to me on my email or my website, which I put into the uh, chat box, and you could contact me there. Um, and I'd be more than happy to do any type of reading. Great. Um, another uh, question we have is, how did you promote your book uh, for it to be ordered by Barnes & Noble, um, et cetera? 
uh, I promoted it. Uh, I think I think how they got it on their radar was that it won an award. So by it winning the award, people were kind of forced on the book, um, which was great for me. Um, but a, a lot of the groundwork that I've been doing has been social media, um, has been doing connections and going out there and doing readings, because uh, one opportunity leads to an, a, another. Uh, when I was doing Fall in Line Holden, I did a reading for the FACE program in Crown Point. And by chance, one of their regional directors was there who loved the idea of the book and how it was written and how it was written for families, especially. They ended up inviting me to a National Parents' as Teachers Conference in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale Florida, uh, four years ago, something like that. I gave a presentation to now a whole room full of FACE programs. And then I've been invited to each of them um, over the years. And so a lot of that promotion has been on the ground, boots on the ground work, um, getting out there, being in the community, talking about the importance of liter literacy and these types of books. And so um, people kind of hear it from there, the word of mouth types of um, promotion, but then also kind of staying up to date and knowing traditional marketing tactics uh, PR tactics, writing press releases. Oh, did, did you know that this Navajo author, uh, author won a American Indian Youth Literature Award and he self-published? Getting that out on people's radars, that's how I got published in Gallup Independent. Um, Navajo Times didn't pick it up, but they did a little blurb on it from what another organization had sent out. Um, I'm going to be appearing in New Mexico Magazine pretty soon because of that. Um, so I could do a whole lecture on marketing um, that I think promotion is a back-end type of um, task you have to do when it comes to writing books. Um, and you get into pricing, you get into promotion, you get into placement, um, all of those four Ps of marketing you get into and all of those things coming together is what gets people hearing about it. So um, it was a lot of things at once, but I think what's been successful for me is the groundwork writing a story that isn't driven by profit, but driven by the community. And that's what got the notice, I think, of the American Indian Library Association, which then gave me the recognition. But if you have that little seal on your book, uh, it'll go a long ways. And I think that's how Barnes & Noble got wind of it. Definitely. Um, I think it, it especially now, um, because you did have a really good point earlier about not having to really count on you know the big five or other you know like a like uh, agents or publishers and what have you um because usually that's kind of the thing that really drives a lot of like you know um like Belagana markets <laughs> um so I, it's really um uh, it's really uh interesting to see because um i you know thinking back to you know how like um the navajo nation music scene like how that blossom and bloom all because of word of mouth too, um, especially some of these country bands, uh, uh, you know, like the metal, hip hop, you know, all these various groups, punk, because, uh, you know, you ask about certain genres or certain bands and people are like, yeah, I know that group. Or because uh, I know uh, one, I think, can be very, uh, at least well known um, on the indigenous platform, you know, besides state line, <laughs> um, like Ethnic Degeneration or EDG from Kienta. Um, because they have such a really good following in many other uh, tribal communities. So, um, you know, so that, that the point that you drove, like it really does um, help, especially where, um, you know, if, if people are doing calls for authors, readings, things like that, that, you know, you can say, hey, you know, right here. <laughs> yeah. And you could connect into people's networks numerous ways. I'm not strong on Twitter. I have about 800 followers. But if you throw up the right hashtag or you get on the right thread, Mm -hmm. It could go a long way. You make yeah. a nice little TikTok. I did a TikTok where I was holding books and I kind of looked like I was Superman. Um, it was less than 30 seconds, but it got shared and had over 1.4 million views. And from that, I got book sales. And so if you're able to tap in and figure out the codes of Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, um, TikTok, then that opens you up a lot of ways too. But um, it, it takes a lot, but just people don't know what that process is. That's why I want to be able to share that with individuals and share this experience because, you know, we always have been in control of our own stories. And even going back to oral history days, 
Um, that was always ours, but then somewhere along the lines, I think it's kind of within the boarding school era of period of where you have to be dependent on somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that's the case for us. We don't have to rely on that anymore. We don't have to have an agent. I'm kind of living proof of that to get to that point. So um, I, I think we're more than capable, even though we experienced a lot of atrocities with boarding school, Livestock Reduction Act, long walk you know we're still here and we're still pushing forth our stories and there's a lot of beauty in who we are as the, and, the, and if we just value that and you know stay true to who we are i don't think we could go wrong because we're known for creating adapting and then making something our own we have that in our blood and our dna so if we're able to push that forth um, i think that's a good way to follow because we don't have to rely on anyone even though they might make you seem like you do, um, you know, just get creative in your path and push it forth in your own way. I think that's a beautiful process. Definitely, definitely. Because um, I think that that definitely helps out with a lot of people who are, you know, a lot of the questions they do center around, you know, that idea of doing that self-publishing and being um, very resilient in, in that sense as well. Um, because there are there, you know, there will be different approaches that people can do. So um, like the, the example that I can think of as well as the, the, the individual from uh, the, I don't want to say child, <laughs> but he's like uh, eight years old, but uh, he wrote his own book essentially. And then he started putting it into the library. So kind of sneaking that in. And then, so, you know, he was like, yeah, he goes, I got my book in the library and uh, you know, it got really, you know, it got really popular because then it became, um, you know, local news. And then from there, it just um, started to uh, perpetuate because, you know, that's how much he wanted to um, share his own stories and share his own illustrations, because he did that all on his own and, you know, piece of paper to do that, um, or at least uh, construction paper, printing paper, what have you, to also do that. So, you know, it, it's, it's in the realm of possibilities for many people to do that. So, yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, it, you know, you know, it always takes a team and uh, uh, everyone involved because, uh, you know, this isn't just, you know, the story that you want to tell, but also kind of, um, you know, putting everything together and then saying, this is the story. This is it. This is kind of um, this kind of perspective because we, we all have different types of uh, views of the picture. You know, there's always a look at something different that um, it really helps to kind of do, you know, um, find a way of fashioning it so that you can do that. So, um, you know, it, it's really, it, it's really amazing to kind of see that. So, um, yeah. And, and um, you should see that inspiration across the board with anybody. It doesn't just apply to books, even yourself, you working at the Navajo Nation Library, I'm sure you're short on resources. I'm sure that there's some bureaucracy you have to go through, but still you're getting creative in how do we put together these author series how do I bring in authentic Navajo books? How do I use Zoom and technology to engage all of these people together and share ideas? You know, I think that's everywhere. How do we, does, how does that apply to education? We see that beauty with our teachers every day and making the most of what they're provided and what supplies they have to, even if it comes out of their own pocketbook, put together to uh, enhance the experience. So I think there's these examples of people doing it everywhere. Uh, I just apply it to writing. And so um, there's a lot of sources of inspirations of how to do it. Just got to keep our eyes open and not copy them, but, you know, imitate how they're doing it and going about it. I think there's some good roadmaps for each of us to follow. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I think we have a, another question from Facebook. Um, this one from Val Yazi. Uh, she asked, uh, or they ask, uh, do you have any advice on how to motivate yourself from going from just ideas to actually writing and publishing a book? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I think it motivates me is just putting, you know, where I'm at today into perspective. I kind of gave a history of our backdrop and going back as far as the long walk, you know, you think about what our ancestors went through just for us to exist and be here today. I always dedicate Fall in Line Holden to the boarding school survivors because if they didn't survive, where would we be? And kind of just putting that things into perspective when things get hard, you know, you got to realize that we are someone's prayer to be here today and to continuing our language, our culture, our identity in a sense. 
so on the very kind of big scale, I think that's how I kind of ground myself and realize that any problem I have isn't that big of a problem, especially when you had people dying on the long walk, having to eat horse feces just to survive. And no, I'm not having to go through any of that stuff. So it kind of grounds me in that sense. Uh, but a big thing that helps me is family, um, having somebody to turn to, to bounce ideas off of. This is where I'm going. Um, even with Horizon, I'm writing a story as a male about female empowerment. Is that the space for me? And so, you know, what you're writing, I was told what you're writing is really a source of support or encouragement. You're promoting or advocating for that future, which we all need allies, you know? And so having people to bounce those ideas off of, is something that helped me. Um, I think even if you don't have anyone, you know, find who that is. You know, you could find that on social media. You now have my email uh, through the chat um, box. So contact me. I'd be more than happy to, you know, help motivate you and keep you on track. But as I mentioned, none of us got here alone. You know, I'm standing on the backs of my grandparents, my parents, my siblings, even thinking of the future and the little ones. I wrote Horizon as a source of inspiration for my nieces to look to, uh, to keep them motivated because I know they're going to face times in their lives where they're going to question their identity, where they might not feel as valued as they should. And so, um, you know, looking towards others is what has helped keep me going, um, which I think everyone should have. So. Definitely, definitely. And those are definitely good words we can go ahead and uh, trail off of because, um, you know, we, we really do appreciate you taking time, you know, out of your day and, you know, being a dad <laughs> to, um, mm -hmm. to, you know, to talk about your books and really how to kind of relate it too, to, um, you know, people who were wanting, who are interested in doing self-publishing work, who are interested in writing um, and, you know, just being able to get their ideas out. So we really do appreciate you taking, you know, the extra time to go ahead and talk to us and explain because, you know, it, it, uh, it always helps when people can do that because a lot of times it's, um, it, it can be where you just feel like, oh, they're just lecturing me. <laughs> but then, you know, it, it really helps to go ahead and um, have that explanation. So we really do appreciate it. So to have from the Navajo Nation Library, myself, um, for, you know, for you reading, explaining, and, and uh, definitely talking it over. So we definitely would be happy to do it again with you, you know, even here at some point too. Yeah. Oh, Nado, I appreciate it. Thank you for everything you set up. And uh, anytime you want to have me back or if I'm passing through the area, I'd be more than happy to stop by. I think a lot of great things happen at the library. Even before the pandemic, I had done the Shema storytelling with Red Miller Cody, which was at the library. So a lot of great activity happens there. The library is a magical place. And so um, great things could happen from it. Just send me the invite, I'll be there. So yeah. Definitely. So. Yeah, once again, thank you all. And um, so we'll go ahead and end it here. Um, and um, so if anybody missed the recording or wants to go back and kind of listen to the stories again, uh, you can rewind it on the recording for Facebook Live. And, um, you know, with your permission, we can do it on YouTube as well. So, you know, people can, you know, be able to do that. So uh, once again, the hat and Sago.